We're building up godly men for a better tomorrow. This is On the Edge with Ken Harrison, where we inspire men of integrity to put faith into action together. Just before we get into today's episode, we'd like to invite you to subscribe to our weekly devotional group. Just text the two words, Promise Keepers, to 31996. Every week you'll receive a challenging devotional that will inspire you to put your faith into action in the real world. Again, text Promise Keepers to 31996. And now, here's today's show. Hello, my name is Rick Burgess. Uh, I am co-host of the Rick and Bubba uh, radio show, which is a radio show that's syndicated around the country. And also, I am uh, the director of themanchurch.com. We are a hub for men's discipleship, providing resources and a discipleship strategy for churches and communities uh, who desire to uh, to reach and disciple the men of their church and community. Um, you know, I want to talk to you today about one of the, uh, it's actually a misnomer. There's there, there's a lot of people that you'll hear say, well, you know, when it comes to uh, trauma uh, in, in, uh, involving marriage, there, there's some traumas uh, that most marriages do not overcome. Uh, and I'm here to tell you that that uh, is actually incorrect. Uh, that is a baseless, um, you know, theory that gets kicked around a lot. And I, I'll tell you uh, briefly the story uh, that I hope uh, God will use to, to speak to you concerning uh, my marriage and, and my wife and I, I'm married to uh, Sherry, uh, the former Sherry Bodine, and, and we have been married for 25 years. Uh, and in 2008, uh, my wife and I, uh, were, we were a, a big family of, of seven. We have five children, uh, have one daughter and four sons. Uh, and uh, the youngest uh, of our children, and our young, it was our youngest son, uh, William Bronner Burgess. And um, so in 2008, uh, I was uh, starting to go out and, and speak at, at youth uh, conferences, and my, my wife had called me. I, I didn't know if it came from my wife or not. I just saw it was our home phone back when we all used to use home phones. Um, and so I called her back, and when I called her back, my wife was frantic. Uh, she went on to explain to me that our youngest son, two and a half years old, uh, Bronner, which is what we call him, uh, had somehow gotten out of the house, uh, to this day we don't know how, and had fallen into our home swimming pool and had drowned. So the car ride from where I live into where my wife was was uh, between four and a half and five hours. Uh, and in the moment when she told me that they were trying to revive our son and that he had drowned, for me to get everyone there to pray, uh, then she hung up. And um, for every man that is watching this, I want you to listen to what happened next. Uh, Because my wife is a devout follower of Jesus. My wife is a godly woman, uh, and she is a blessing to me. Uh, And God has used her uh, to make me a better man. And she said, I remember when the doctor was trying to revive our son, I began to pray that he would be brought back to life. And she said, I heard coming out of of my mouth something that I could not say. As we think about Romans chapter 8, when Paul tells us that sometimes the Holy Spirit intercedes and prays for us what we ought to pray. And she she said she heard herself say, not my will be done, Lord, but your will be done. She said, I couldn't say that. The Holy Spirit said it on her behalf. And she said after that, the doctor looked at her and said, we have to stop. And she knew in that moment that our child had, had died his earthly death. And the Psalms begin to come back, uh, Psalms 139, 13 through 16, uh, where the psalmist says clearly that God knows everything about us when he weaves us together in our mother's womb. And the psalmist goes on to say, you knew every day that I would live, and the number of those days before I had ever lived one. My wife began to experience that God is close to the brokenhearted. However, she said, I remember that my pastor showed up and he tried to comfort me. She said, I remember our family members that were there. 
they tried to comfort me. I remember our friends being there for me, and they tried to comfort me. But they all knew the same thing that I knew, and that was that they could not be my husband. They could not be the children's father. So we waited on him because no one could replace him. Now, I know that these words that I'm saying right now are riveting, but they're crucial. If there was ever a woman that that I would have thought would not need her husband in this time, it would be my wife. She could take you through Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to the end of the Revelation, and she loves the God that she worships. She loves the Savior that redeemed us. But in her moment of despair, she said that she needed her husband and that no one else could be him. And, and when, I, when I think about this and I, and I recall this truth, I, I think to myself, what if I had decided not to grow in my faith? What if I had decided not to, to learn the Word of God? What if I had decided to never be discipled? What if in this moment when my wife was looking for the answers from the Word of God and wanting to hear from her husband who God is in the middle of something like that, What if I didn't know? What if I had never taken the time to have those answers? Where would we be now? Like I said, we've been married for for 25 years, and our marriage has not just survived, it has thrived. You know why? Because it really isn't true that the death of a child destroys most marriages. That just isn't true. It's something that some psychologist somewhere came up with. But it isn't the truth. No, great trauma like the death of an earthly child does not destroy every marriage. It reveals the weakness or the strength of that marriage on whether or not it's truly attached to and lives under the authority of Jesus Christ. What is the key to having a marriage that cannot be destroyed? Jesus. Simply, Jesus. And for the men that are watching this right now, being the spiritual leader of your home is not an option. Your wife and your family will pay a price if you have not devoted yourself and be diligent, as Peter told us to be, to present yourself as spotless and blameless and at peace with God. If you don't have those answers, it's not because God has withheld them from you. And then your marriage might pay a price. But if you have the answers and you know who God is, I'm not saying just know about God, but really know God, then your marriage can withstand anything. Hey, Promise Keeping Men, John and Lisa Bevere here, and we are so excited and honored to be able to speak to you about marriage. Yeah. I love talking about marriage. Lisa, we're working on our 39th year. It's true. And I wanna say it has been absolutely an adventure, and it's been fun, and it's been... Challenging. Challenging. I think they ask us to talk on marriage because you're Italian and I'm Sicilian, and they said if we can get those kind of intense right. personalities to talk about marriage, it'll be a win. I will say that, um, you know, guys, you're looking at a man that's been married almost 40 years, and I can honestly say this, I am more in love with Lisa than the day we married. And that is one of my marriage goals. And we'll talk about this briefly a little bit later, but everybody should have goals. Just like we have, we have uh, goals for our businesses, we have goals for uh, life, we have business plans, blueprints for house, we should have goals for our marriage. I mean, it's amazing. People spend hours and hours and hours. They prepare for their wedding day. I mean, probably 400 hours uh, between buying the dress, the tuxes, getting the groomsmen, getting everybody together, the bachelor party. So for the first day, we spend all this time preparing, but we don't prepare for the middle and for the end. I'd love to open up with Malachi chapter 2, verse 15. Now, I am reading from the message paraphrase, guys. It just kind of brings it home. 
I, I really yeah. believe so. And it, it's, uh, it's our, one of our favorite scriptures for marriage. And so it says, God, not you, made marriage. His spirit inhabits even the smallest details of marriage. And what does he want from marriage? So God has a purpose for marriage, yeah. right? Children of God, that's what. So guard the spirit of your marriage within you. Don't cheat on your spouse. Oh my yeah. gosh, there's so much here, there's babe. There's a ton in there. Yeah. Um, so first and foremost, you talked about you have a goal for marriage. Yep. Obviously, God has a goal for marriage. Yeah. And so the first goal is that marriage is a God idea. It's a God idea. And His Spirit inhabits even the smallest details of marriage. Now, John, we don't usually fight about the big things. We fight <laughs> about the small things in Correct. marriage. Correct. Yes. Correct. And as, as God and, and Scripture is saying, says, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Right. But God actually wants us to invite him into every single detail of our marriage. There's nothing in your marriage that is too small or insignificant for God. His spirit wants to inhabit the smallest details of your marriage. And marriage has a purpose. And if we allow it, marriage has the power to remake us into children of God. And and so when you look at what God's saying here, most people read the scripture and they're thinking, okay, God... Uh, hates divorce. He loves marriage because we get babies. No, he actually says marriage is one of the best refining tools to bring out my character and nature in yeah. you if you yeah. will cooperate with the process. Yeah. And so anytime we are talking about refining, because refining is purifying, you get the impurities out, you leave the pure in. God has put his nature in every single one of us, mm -hmm. guys. And he wants that nature to come out, work out your salvation. So God says, in marriage, two people are gonna get really close and it starts out all romantic and everything and you guys understand it, but then all of a sudden we start seeing the little things and it started maybe bringing a little irritations and all that, so let me ask you, is that the problem of your spouse or is that irritation a problem with impatience or you know, not, not having compassion or understanding? And so this is why Peter says, dwell, dwell with your wives with understanding. Yeah. So what happens is your character becomes more long-suffering, more patient, more enduring, more focused. If you choose to. If you choose, you choose to. to allow it. So marriage can be the demise of some men, whereas it is actually the character builder of other men. And this is what I believe and Lisa believes and um, we wrote a book together called The Story of Marriage, and, and I have to say, I feel like I'm actually taking Lisa's verse here because she introduced this to me, and it, it opened my eyes to marriage in a whole new realm. Um, when we were early on in our years, I would get so frustrated, and I would allow my frustration to dominate me instead of realizing frustration that I'm experiencing. Could it be, and usually it's 99% of the time, that it's exposing something in me that needs to be worked out of my life. See, God, when he creates us, will not violate our will. So if you want to be stubborn, you want to be impatient, God's not going to force you to change. But what marriage helped is it helped me see, John, you're being a jerk right now to your wife, and this isn't her fault. It may be her behavior that is exposing this. It may be the heat of this situation that's bringing this impurity to the surface. But one time God spoke to me when my anger and my impatience was coming out. And he said, son, if you look at your gold ring on your finger, it's not pure gold. And if you put it in a furnace and heat it up several thousand degrees, the impurities come to the surface. And he said, what you're seeing has always been in you. It's been invisible to you just as... I can't see the impurities in my gold ring right now, but I put it in the furnace and I'll see them. They'll appear. He said, it was invisible to you, but visible to me. Now, what are you going to do with it? You can own it and repent, or you can justify yourself. And he said, it'll all go back down. We got to start all over again. And that's bad for my wife because now she's got to put up with the same old bad behavior of me, right? So I, Lisa, I really believe this is what God's talking about when he says he wants children of God. Yeah, it absolutely works both ways. And what I love is it says, so guard the spirit of marriage. So what is that? That's guarding the oneness that God puts us together. And one doesn't mean same. 
Like when I got married to John, I immediately tried to change John to me. But the、mm. truth is that John needs to be John, and I need to be me. And because we were both strong, we were using our strengths to point out one another's weaknesses. But when we are guarding the spirit of marriage, that、mm. is. Within us, so when God, when there's a covenant, like a lot of people say, it's just a piece of paper. It doesn't mean anything. No, no, it's not between two people, and it's not a piece of paper. It is something that God weaves together. It's between three parties. It is God. It is you. It is your spouse. And God says, okay, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to take two very different people. And I'm going to make them one. And John, when it says "Don't cheat on your spouse," you and I love to play games. Our family, with four sons, I had to jump into a competitive family. Everything became a game. People weren't happy if someone didn't go to bed a loser and somebody else went to bed a winner. But in marriage, when one spouse wins. The other spouse wins. So well said. Because you're one, and so too many husbands and wives they're competing with one another rather than celebrating one another's strengths. I know that I thought if I celebrated your strengths, then you would just go crazy and out of control.、Right. And so you and I, for years, I want to say for at least eight years, maybe even the first decade of our marriage, remember, almost four decades, we used our strengths against one another and we acted like. Enemies,、right. rather than allies. Right. So your wife is not the one that is your nag. She is not the one holding you down. Maybe she's not doing it right. But normally, if a wife is actually criticizing the husband, it's because she's doing the opposite way of trying to bring out the best in you. I found out that my husband does better when I speak to his destiny rather than criticize his history, rather than rehearse his mistakes. If I speak to the Things I see that are God breathed on his life, then he actually wants to rise to that. But when I actually attack what he's done in the past, then he wants to attack those places back in my life that were in the past. But what I love it says, "Don't cheat on your spouse." Okay, amplify that. And, yeah, I want to talk about that because immediately people think, "Oh, that means commit adultery." Right. Or maybe you and might, it could mean that. It, but, ab- no, it absolutely it, it can absolutely mean that. Yes. But it also could mean that you are robbing your spouse of life's best when you cheat somebody. You you say, "I'm going to not let you have wins." I'm not going to let you have victories. I'm not going to let you grow into everything that God created you to be. See, when John and I got married, he said, "Oh my gosh, she is going to be godly. She is going to be great with money. I bet she's going to be an amazing mother." But all I had was a suntan and a six pack because I used to work out. And somehow, John began to speak all these. Things of life over me, and I thought before this man figures out, I don't have any of those things. I'm going to get into the Word of God, and I'm going to grow in the likeness of the love that John was showing me. See, each and every one of us grow in the likeness of the love we are shown, or we shrink according to the shame. And so, I want to say, what you can do as a husband is you can love your wife. Into wholeness. Well, you know, you look at what Paul said. He said to nourish and cherish. And I want you to think about what nourishes a plant. You give it what it needs to grow: water, fertilizer. So, if you're critical of your wife, if you're angry with your wife, you're not giving her what she needs to grow. You're actually tearing her down. And any time you tear her down, you're tearing yourself down. God gave me a vivid image one time. He said, "Any time you're mean to Lisa, just take a knife and jab yourself. You're literally hurting yourself."、Yeah. And so. Here's the thing. You made a comment that is so crucial. The covenant. I always looked at this as a young man. As the covenant is between the man and the woman. Yes, that's true, as Lisa said. But I want to amplify this point. The covenant is also between you and God. I made a covenant with God when I married Lisa that I would be a protective husband of her. I would love her. I would cherish her. I would nourish her. Now. Let's say Lisa's behavior is not pleasing to me. Let's say I feel like she's not being fair, she's being critical, she's being a neck. Let's just assume that. If I now return that, I am violating the covenant that I made with God. When I got a hold of this, this this was a game changer for me, 
because Lisa and I were very immature when we got married. We both loved God with all of our heart, but if she hurts me with her words, I'm going to hurt her back. That led to destructive behavior that took a lot of time for both of us to heal. Once I had the revelation, and I think both of us really came into this at the same time because that behavior stopped on both Lisa's part and my part. Mm -hmm. Once I realized that I made a covenant with God to love, nourish, and cherish, and honor, which I will talk about in just a moment, all of a sudden now, it doesn't matter how I feel she's treating me. I made a covenant with God to build her. And if you look at what Peter says, Peter makes this statement, husbands, honor your wives as the weaker vessel. Now, weaker doesn't mean she's beneath you. It only means, and I mean it only means, she can't bench press as much as you. That weaker vessel literally means physically she is not as strong as you. That's a typical woman, a typical man. But he makes a statement. He says, "As honor her as an heir together in the grace of life. Yeah. Now, that means we're on the same level. Okay. I may oh, be yeah. the head of the home in, uh, and, and, but, but, but what did Jesus prove as far as the head of the home? He got down and washed the disciples feet. In other words, I'm the chief servant here. That's what they did. They washed people's feet when they came in off the street in wealthy people's homes. He said, I'm the chief servant. So when you take that leadership role of chief servant of the house, it doesn't lose the authority of the husband, but it does actually transform it in a beautiful way. Mm -hmm. So, Honor her as the weaker vessels, as heirs together. So as far as you're standing with God is you're exactly equal. As heirs together in the grace of life. And it says, if you don't honor her, go read it in 1 Peter chapter 3. If you don't honor her, it says that heaven will not listen to your prayers. Wow. I've had guys come up to me before and go, hey, John, would you pray for me? And I think I want, what, what I really want to say, mm. um, I'm seeing the way you're talking to your wife. Yeah. Why do I want to pray with you right now? Because heaven's not even listening to you. Man, that is a terrible place to be that heaven is not even listening to you. But go read it. It's there. And that's because God, when he puts us as the head of the home, expects us to be the chief servant, the chief builder upper, the chief lover, the chief uh, person who speaks life into the wife, life of his wife. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to close it with this, guys. I can walk into a room and I can tell you how well loved a woman is by her husband. If her countenance radiates, she's well loved. If she's downtrodden, she's not well loved. Why? Because the wife is the glory of the man, which means she reflects the way he wow. treats her. When I'm in the presence of Jesus and he is blessing me with his presence, I come out of that quite changed. Even so, when a woman comes out of a situation at home with her husband where he has built her up, nourished and cherished her, she will go into public with a glow, with a radiation on her face. That's what you want your wife because I'm going to tell you something. When you do that, your wife stays beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful because beauty is so much more than just the physical. Well, guys, we've gone just a tad over and I'm hoping that this will give you some nuggets to be able to really build your marriage. And so, Father, we just bless these men in the name of Jesus, and we pray for strength and health and prosperity in their homes. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. My female coworker gets me, so it's okay to get her perspective on my marriage. Myth. That is a myth. That may be something that makes you feel good. That may be something that you try to tell yourself to justify with the, what's going on at your job with this female coworker you can really talk to and confide in about your marriage. And she gets you right until she gets you right. Go get sharpened by another dude. If you're going to be sharpened in your marriage, go get sharpened by a man who understands men, who understands God's word, who can hold you accountable as a man in your marriage. Big buzzer, big stop sign right there. No, it's not okay. It's not okay. There's a barrier. Only one person has your heart, and that's the person you said I do to. And when you invite somebody else in, you're asking for big time trouble. Why don't you do this? Protect your marriage. Guard that marriage and keep the sanctity of your marriage between you and your wife. That's a that's a recipe for disaster. And stupid is as stupid does. Knock that off, son. Okay, if you're that stupid, 
I don't know what to do with you. You need to find another religion. Buddhism might work or even atheism. But if you're a Christ follower, clearly, if you're having marriage problems and you're telling a female co-worker, you are doomed. So work through that, find the right person to talk to. It's why we often talk about having a strong accountability partner as men. That's the place to go. That will be beneficial for your marriage. I remember one time, uh, we're, we're filming this in my living room right now. You can probably see out the window. Sometimes I'll sit here and I'll watch my son and his friends. He's young, so sometimes I'll watch him play with like sticks or he'll make forts out of boxes or he'll, they'll use rocks to play some kind of battle or whatever. But they're using all these like natural elements of the world to find adventure, to create adventure. And I remember one time I was looking at him playing. I, I remember thinking, does that go away? Does that like longing for adventure go away? I mean, as men, we grow up and we, we move from one adventure to another, whether it's getting a license or graduating high school or going to college, falling in love for the first time, like all these adventures that we move into. And then all of a sudden we get to the spot where we're like in our 30s or 40s and we've done everything that the world told us we should do. We got married, we got the big job, we fell in love, we had the kids, we bought the house, we did it. And so now it's like, all right, now what? Now or what are we supposed to do with our lives? Did you know that the Bible hundreds of times throughout the scriptures say some variation of do not be afraid or fear not? I think that God is constantly reminding his people to not be afraid because he's constantly calling them into really, really scary things. Man, when's the last time you've been afraid for the glory of God? Dude, like we get in trouble in all kinds of ways. We look for adventure. We chase after all kinds of things that might make us afraid. If we're just honest, man, like you might be looking at stuff on the computer you know you're not supposed to be looking at. Maybe you're having a few extra drinks. Maybe you're trying some stuff you shouldn't be trying. Maybe you're talking to that woman that you probably know you shouldn't be talking to. Whatever it is, but there's all these things that we're chasing after that kind of get our heart rate up. Get that little boost of adrenaline. And it, for a second, it feels good. But dude, you know that's not actually gonna satisfy. The truth is, man, I think God deeply desires to call you into adventure, something that's way bigger than yourself. And instead of finding adventure in the kingdom of God, we as men often find adventure in really dumb or really dangerous things, man. And it's not always sinful. Maybe you're just chasing a bunch of hours at work to try to climb the ladder or fill up your bank account or get a new car or boat, like some things that really, they're not sinful, but at the end of the day, you know, like your heart wants more than that. You know it, I know it, our souls want more. And so here's my challenge to you. As a man of God who wants to lead his family well, who wants to lead his wife well, here's what I would say to you. Maybe the time is now that you repent, that you say, God, I'm sorry that I've chased after adventure and all kinds of things that don't make sense for the kingdom. God, I want to be scared for something that you're calling me into. Maybe it means sitting down with your wife, holding her hands and say, babe, I want us to be a family that seeks adventure in the kingdom. Here's what I mean really maybe specifically for you. Maybe God is calling you to foster a child or to adopt a child. Maybe God's calling you to step into a really hard conversation with an old friend or family member that you've buried that relationship under the rug for a long time and it means there's time to be, there's, it's time to reconcile. Maybe it means you gotta go talk to the neighbor who you've been avoiding because it's just easier to come home and not deal with them. But God's saying, listen, I want you to be on mission in your neighborhood and start to use your time to see yourself as a missionary on your street. Like, dude, I don't know what the adventure is that God's calling you to, but he is calling you something bigger than yourself. But when you start to do that, it's amazing how all the stuff that you thought would satisfy your soul or the stuff that felt really big isn't that big anymore. The stuff that you were fighting with your wife about, the bills, the job, the car, whatever, it's not that big anymore when you guys are together on mission for the glory of God. When you're fostering a child, man, you're not really thinking about the dumb sins that you are getting entangled with. God is calling you to more, man. He has an adventure that your soul longs to be part of. Don't settle for less. Jump into the adventure God has for you. Hey, Promise Keepers, what a privilege and an honor it is to be able to address you today. I just want to say, first of all, I love Ken Harrison. He is a man of God. You know, recently, my wife and I had a dinner, and we spent 
five hours doing nothing but talking about the things of God, and I realize that Promise Keepers has a great, great, glorious, and bright future. I want to say this, that Ken and I talked quite extensively, and I believe the aspect, because you have so many that are speaking to you today, but the what I carry, the gifting that God's placed on my life, is to help you understand the importance of the fear of the Lord in a man of God's life. Now, let me say this. You say fear of God. First of all, let me alleviate any of you turning me off right at the beginning. The fear of the Lord is so much different than being scared of God. In fact, I'm going to make this statement. The fear of the Lord is not to be scared of God. How can we have a relationship of intimacy with God if we are afraid of Him? And this is God's passionate desire, is to have a very close and intimate relationship with you. What does Adam do as soon as he sins in the garden? He hides from the presence of the Lord. The person who fears God has nothing to hide. He's terrified of being away from God. So let's establish this. First and foremost, the definition of the fear of the Lord is to be scared. Let me make this stronger. It is to be terrified of being away from God. How else can I define the fear of the Lord? It is to venerate God. Now, what does venerate mean? It means to honor, respect, esteem, value, reverence Him, and to stand in awe of Him above everything or everyone else. It's when we take His heart. Now, when we do this... We now love what he loves, and we hate what he hates. Now, 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 did you just hear what I said? We don't dislike what he hates. We actually hate what he hates. Now, you say God hates? Oh, yeah, God hates. He does. Now, let me say this. I want to alleviate any kind of concerns or worries in what I'm talking about. There have been religious people in the past and they'll make a statement like, well, I fear God. That's why I hate those sinners over there. No, you don't fear God because you hate what he loves. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God loves sinners. What he hates is the sin that undoes us. And if you remember Hebrews chapter 1, God the Father inaugurated Jesus to being King of kings and Lord of lords. Well, if you read this chapter carefully, God the Father makes a statement to Jesus Christ the Son on that inauguration day. And he, this is what he says. This is Hebrews 1 verse 9, King James Version. He said, because you have loved righteousness. And the Holy Spirit said, son, stop right there. You love righteousness, so do many Christians. But God didn't stop there. He said, because you've loved righteousness and hated, listen to the word hated, lawlessness, which lawlessness means insubordination to the authority of God. And that's what all sin is. Okay, sin is lawlessness, 1 John. Lawlessness is simply when we don't obey God's authority. You've got to remember, guys, Adam didn't jump in bed with a prostitute in the garden. He simply disobeyed God's authority. If you look at all, the root of all sin, it is lawlessness. So I'm going to read it that way, okay? Because you have loved righteousness and hated sin Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you more than your companions. And I remember when I saw that, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, Son, learn to hate sin the way I hate sin, and you'll see the anointing of God increase upon your life. If you look at Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, you will find out that Jesus was heard. His prayers of crying out to God were heard. Were heard. Listen to me. It's one thing to pray. It's another thing to be heard were heard because of his godly fear. Oh my goodness, are you hearing this? His prayers were heard because of his godly fear. Now, here's the fear of the Lord. I am more terrified of disappointing the heart of God than I am the person I'm looking at. So here's something you're going to find out. You'll serve whoever you fear. If you fear man, you'll end up cowering and serving man. If you fear God, you will never cower to any man. And this is one of the great, great benefits. The only way you can be a promise keeper, guys, is when you fear God. I look at Solomon, King Solomon. He wrote that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Man, did that guy have wisdom. He was able to build a kingdom by the grace of God and the fear of the Lord upon his life in such a way that kings and queens from all over would come to see what this man had done. However... There was a time in his life that he lost his godly fear. 
He began to marry many women. He began to even worship their idols. Now, you look at the book of Ecclesiastes. It is a book that a lot of people avoid. I personally feel it's one of my favorite books in the Bible because it illustrates a major point that all of us men need to understand. The book of Ecclesiastes is a man who has the fear of the Lord and loses it. What happens when Solomon loses it? He becomes very cynical, jaded. He is down on everything. He is not in a good state of mind. He's actually lost his hope. He says right up front, life is vain. What goes around comes around. What good is it if we labor under the sun because we lose everything? He goes on and on and on. You see a very dismal man with a, a very little amount of hope who is absolutely cynical on life. Well, the reason I love this book is because it shows what happens to us if we don't have the fear of the Lord or lose it. But at the very end, if you go back to chapter 12 of Ecclesiastes, you will find out he starts saying, remember God, remember God, remember God, remember God, remember God. And then he makes this statement in the final verses of that book. He said, this is my conclusion of all of life. Here's my conclusion. Fear God and keep his commandments. He said, this is man's all. So in other words, Solomon realized one of the most valuable attributes, virtues in life was something he had lost. And that's why he was a man who lost so much. He could have been so prominent. His legacy could have been magnificent, but he lost the fear of the Lord. And he realized at the very end of his life, this is what I lost that was so valuable. I look at people that have lost a lot in life, a lot of that relationships or their, their post or their, their, their business, their ministry. And what happened is they lost the fear of the Lord. What happened is they got started focusing on the wrong things. The fear of the Lord keeps your vision accurate. Could this be why the Apostle Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling? Could this be why the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1, having the promise of walking in the presence of God, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. He doesn't say we perfect holiness in the love of God. He doesn't say we work out our salvation in the love of God. Why? The fear of the Lord, according to Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. The fear of the Lord, according to Proverbs, is to depart from evil. When you fear God, you have such awe, reverence, and respect for Him that you realize He is ever-present. He knows every thought. He knows every motive. He knows every intention. The people that don't have the fear of the Lord, they reduce God's image down to a man, and they think they can do things and He won't notice. If you go to the Old Testament, you'll find many of those leaders in Israel made the statement, the Lord doesn't see us. They had no fear of God. Therefore, they didn't depart from evil. Hey guys, if we're going to be promise keepers, we need to have the spirit, the Holy Spirit of the fear of the Lord. And the Bible says we receive the Holy Spirit when we ask our heavenly father. So father, in Jesus name, I pray for every man that's listening right now. I pray that the spirit of the fear of the Lord would rest upon them. I pray that the blood of Jesus would cleanse us from sins, but I release your Holy Spirit of the fear of the Lord upon their lives even right now. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I love you guys. Today's episode is brought to you through the generosity of Waterstone. For nearly 40 years, Waterstone has assisted givers in supporting their favorite charities, like Promise Keepers, by crafting customized, innovative giving solutions. Waterstone gift strategists stand ready to create your personalized charitable plan, utilizing business interests, real estate, appreciated assets, charitable trusts, giving funds, and more. 
These donor-specific giving strategies allow givers to bypass capital gains taxes, receive a fair market value charitable deduction, and have tax-free growth for years to come. Prioritize income, minimize taxes, and optimize your giving with Waterstone. Find out how to give and receive the most from your assets by visiting www.waterstone.org. And now, back to today's show. What's my best advice for newlyweds is simply this. Have realistic expectations. Don't go into marriage thinking, I found the one. No, go into marriage saying, I'm going to be the one and I'm going to seek to grow as one. Understand this. My dad taught me this. You do not date to marry, you marry to date. And men forget that. We'll do all the stuff. I mean, we'll pull out all the stops to try to get her, but we won't do anything once we have her. We say this about God all the time. If he did it before, he can do it again. Um, Your wife is thinking the same thing about you. If he did it before, why isn't he doing it again? My best advice for newlyweds is to pray together every single night before you go to sleep to pray with one another, go to God together, and to honor God's word. Read the word of God together. Praying together, reading God's word together has a way of calibrating the relationship. Man, I would say 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, y'all. That is the key uh, to love. It's the first attribute of love. In a way, it's the last attribute of love in 1 Corinthians. And you learn patience and you can navigate anything in marriage. You know what? I'd like to be funny and jokey, but this isn't. If you're going to get married, all I'm going to tell you is what worked for me. And it's two things. Number one, and it's going to be obvious, God has to be number one. Not in your marriage, even though, of course, that's true. But what I mean is to you. Secondly, you need to tell each other divorce is not an option. Okay? If you make that the case, then every time the difficulty comes, it normally would have broken you up. And you say, you know what? we got to work through this. This is the way where we're really going to start seeing what our character is or isn't and how we're going to get better. This is the time. Divorce is not an option. I actually give my wife consistently a massage every morning before her feet hit the ground, before she gets out of bed. There's, there's a beauty in doing what's right, starting off the day the right way. So find yours. Hey, it is great to be with you for this special Promise Keepers Marriage Conference. And I want to talk to you about the four laws of love. These are very simple but profound laws that are found within the Word of God. And I found out about these about 44 years ago. My wife Karen and I have been married for 47 years. We're well, just about to have our 48th anniversary, if you can believe that. I'm two years away from being married for 50 years. So that's, that's a big deal. But we got married when we were 19 years old. Uh, we had no idea about marriage. No one ever talked to us about it. We didn't go through any pre-marriage counseling. But we didn't meet the preacher until the day we got married. And so we were just totally ignorant concerning the marriage relationship. And Karen was a believer before I was. I got saved a week before we got married. So needless to say, I was rough around the edges. We began to have problems uh, right into our marriage. I mean, we immediately began to have problems. And we loved each other and we were committed to our marriage, but we just began to fight and fight and fight. And so three years after we were married, we got into a huge argument and I told Karen to get out of the house. And, you know, really and truly, I just didn't think that we could stay together any longer. Uh, We were damaging each other. And and I was especially damaging her because I was verbally abusive. I was dominant. And one night I just told her to get out of the house. Well, that was the night that the Lord really broke through my heart. It really was a supernatural thing. And in the weeks to come, after that evening, I went to a text of Scripture that the Lord led me to. It's Genesis chapter 2, where God created marriage. And the Lord led me to this text of Scripture that I'm going to talk to you from, and He showed me these four laws. I had never seen them before. I mean, I was was shocked that there were any laws concerning marriage at all. But I want to make a couple of statements, two statements uh, about marriage that may surprise you, but I want to make these statements because they're true. The first is, marriage is the safest relationship on earth period. Even with all the problems that people are having in marriage today, marriage is the safest relationship on earth. My second statement is this, you have a 100% chance of success in marriage when you do it God's way. The reason that marriages are failing, see Karen and I were, were ignorant. We had absolutely no idea of what we were doing. Well, most people that are failing in marriage are sweet people. They're wonderful people. They just don't know. These are very simple but profound. They're laws. These are not principles. 
These are laws that God created to govern the marriage relationship. And let me read you the text here. This is where God creates marriage. Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. He took one of his ribs and clo closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man, and Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Now God is saying here, when God creates a marriage, He's saying for this cause, for the, for the cause of marriage, you're going to need to do these four things if you're going to succeed, and these are inviolable. So let me tell you about the four laws of love. The number one is the law of priority. The number one, this is what God, God said. Genesis 2, 24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother. Okay, leave, the word leave there is this word. It means just to let go of. For the sake of marriage, you have to reprioritize your life. Okay, before you get married, your mother and father are the most important relationship you have in your life. But for the sake of marriage, you have to reprioritize. That's what it means. That doesn't mean you forsake your parents or in any way, you know, get rid of them. It just means mom and dad, before I got married, you were first. Now my wife, my husband is going to be first. You have to reprioritize it. Now, Jesus said when he was questioned by the Pharisees about divorce, in Matthew 19, he said, What God has joined together, let not men separate. See, marriage is not a piece of paper. Marriage is not just a social contract or a social relationship. Marriage is an act of the Spirit of God. God takes two people and He makes them one. And that relationship has to be more important than any other relationship in your life. See, you fall in love because you prioritize each other. And you're saying, you are the most important person in my life. You're more important to me than anybody else. And listen, most things that harm marriages aren't bad things. They're good things out of priority. Children can destroy a marriage. Children are wonderful. They're precious. But they're a temporary assignment. They're, they come and they go. Okay, You raise them and then they go. And so what are you going to have left when your children leave? And how are your children going to succeed in marriage if you don't show them how? You need to protect your marriage and work on your marriage for the sake of your children. It's more important than work. It's more important than church. It's more important than friends, anything else. So when you begin to break the law of priority, your spouse is going to resent it. And they're going to begin, they're going to, begin to say to you, you know, why don't you come home from work? Why, why do you stay at work all the time? You know, why are you always with the kids and give everything to the kids and don't have anything left for me? And when you don't validate that complaint, that causes the damage that begins to erode the marriage. To have a good marriage, you begin by saying to your spouse in real terms, you're the most important thing in my life. Number one law, the law of priority. Number two law, the law of pursuit. It says a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife. The word cleave there, this is not a common word for us. And so, you know, it's hard to understand we just read it at the surface because meat cleaver, you know, you think of cleave, think of meat cleaver, you don't want to get that picture in your head related to marriage. Um, it means to pursue with all your energy. A man will pursue his wife with all of his energy. See, marriage is work. Marriage is work. There's no such thing as a fairy tale relationship where you just get married and live happily, happily ever after. In fact, many people have a deeply rooted romantic misconception that if I marry the right person, I shouldn't have to work at it. That's crazy. You can't meet your own needs and you're sworn to fidelity. You realize the reason that you get married in the first place is we can't meet our own needs? And did you know that the needs of a woman, the basic needs of a woman are different than the needs of a man? A man's need is honor, respect, sex. He wants to be friends with his wife and he wants domestic support. Those are the four basic needs of a man. A woman wants security. Number one thing for her, number one thing that makes a woman feel secure is a selfless, sacrificial man. The number one thing that makes a woman feel insecure is a selfish, detached man. So when your heart is turned toward her, she feels secure. When you're sacrificing and prioritizing and working at the relationship, she feels secure. Open and honest communication. She doesn't want headlines. She wants you to open up and talk. That is as important to a woman as sex is to a man, is opening up and talking and revealing your thoughts and emotions to her. She wants soft, non-sexual affection. There's a need for sex, but soft, non-sexual affection is one of her most important needs. And she wants leadership, not to be dominated, but she wants her husband to be the leader 
of the finances, the home, the spirituality, the children, those kinds of things like that. And so we have different needs. If I could meet my own needs, I wouldn't get married. And see, I can't go shop in other stores. I'm sworn to fidelity. I'm sworn to my wife, Karen. If she doesn't meet my needs, I'm in trouble. If I don't meet her needs, I'm in trouble. And in my book, The Four Laws of Love, one of the chapters in there is called The Servant Rules. You have to serve. Marriage is about serving. I was very selfish when Karen and I got married. I didn't want to serve her. I wanted her to energetically meet my needs, but I didn't meet her needs. But when our marriage changed and when I began to understand the law of pursuit, I began to pursue her again. This is the importance of like a weekly date night. It's the importance of sitting down every day and having time face to face to talk without computers, kids, cell phones, TV, or anything else. It's the importance of making disciplines and habits in your marriage every single day where you're always working at your marriage. And, and by the way, if you've fallen out of love, Karen and I were completely out of love. Did you know that when you begin to work again at your marriage, you'll fall back in love? Don't worship your emotions. Your, your emotions are not the master of your life. They shouldn't be. Do what's right. And when you do what's right, what happens is you will fall back in love. Jesus says, wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What it means is wherever you're depositing the best of your life, your passion is going to be there. When he says that's where your heart is, that's the Greek word cardia. It means the seed of your passions. Because these laws work. This is how marriage works. Marriage has to be first. You have to work at it. There's never going to be a relationship. There's no such thing as marrying your perfect soulmate and you don't have to work at the relationship. I've been a marriage counselor for 40 years and I'm telling you, the greatest marriages are always the people with the best work ethic people that don't mind serving each other and people that love serving each other and people that don't mind hard work. That's where great marriages come from. Number three law is the law of partnership. It says they shall become one flesh. There's never a reference in the book of Genesis before the fall of Adam being over Eve or Eve being over Adam. They were equals. And this is what marriage is about. You're equals in a marriage. Men and women are equal and husbands and wives are equal. What that means is if your marriage is a corporation, you both have the same amount of stock. One person doesn't have more than the other. Listen to this scripture, by the way. This is 1 Corinthians 7. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Now, this isn't a license for abuse. It's a license for use. And what, what Paul is saying here is, when you get married, you give up ownership of your body to your spouse for the sake of their sexual needs. Selfishness destroys a marriage. Selfishness destroys marriage. I was very selfish. Dominance destroys a marriage. I was very dominant. And so, and by the way, dominance is equal among men and women. There are as many dominant women as there are men. The studies have shown, have proven, that to the degree that there's dominance in a relationship is to the degree the relationship doesn't work. A marriage relationship. Shared control. You have to be partners. And if you're, I was a dominant person. Okay, so how did I change? I just stopped. I stopped trying to control everything. I stopped trying to control Karen. When I began to treat Karen as an equal and stop bullying her and dominating her, she blossomed like a rose and our relationship went to the next level. And by the way, our sexual relationship went to the next level. I couldn't believe it. I wouldn't have been an idiot that long if I'd have known I was not getting the best sex I could have gotten, I can tell you that. The payoff in this is you have a partner, you have a friend. This is how you develop the friendship and your relationship. And number four is the law of purity. It says the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. Okay, The word naked there just means they were exposed. They, did, they didn't have any clothes on, but mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, Adam and Eve were naked. God designed marriage to be the most intimate relationship on earth. Listen, they were naked until they sinned. And when they sinned, they immediately began to hide themselves. And they were full of fear and shame once they sinned. And here's the principle. Marriage only works in an atmosphere of purity. In an atmosphere of sin, marriage doesn't work. Okay. So my wife and I uh, fought. And when I, we would fight, I didn't fight fair. I said things to hurt her. And uh, so I've changed. And I, I, the, the night that I repented to Karen and repented to God and began to change, I truly began to change. And one of the things that I changed was, I was careful and I took responsibility. In all of our marriage, I had never one time said I was sorry, not one time. Okay, well, I became really good at it. And the night that our marriage began to change, I told Karen I was sorry. So we then began to relate based on the four laws. And uh, I began to be careful. And when I made a mistake and I would hurt her feelings, I would say, Karen, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Did it every day. 
Well, about three or four years later, we were having a conversation and she said something to me that was very, very personal, a very intimate, personal detail. And I said to her, I said, how long has this been going on? How long have you been thinking that? She said, years. And I said, why didn't you say that to me? She said, you weren't safe, Jimmy. You weren't safe until now. See, trust is earned in drops and lost in buckets. If you're gonna, if you're gonna have an intimate relationship, you've gotta be careful with this thing right here. You've gotta be careful with your behavior and you have to be responsible with your behavior. And if you've done something wrong, don't blame somebody else. Just say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? And, and, and mean it and do it as often as you need to. And see, your spouse is supposed to be your safe place and you're supposed to be your spouse's safe place. And the question is, does your spouse feel safe around you? Because God designed marriage. It only works the way it's supposed to work in an atmosphere of purity. So I'm saying these are very simple laws, four laws, but this, this is what guards and guides the institution of marriage, whether you realize it or not. God bless you, good to be with you. Jimmy Evans, powerful. In the beginning, I guided you, created the rubric, the framework, of one of the most transformative, impactful summits you could ever participate, definitely this year, as it pertains to marriages and healthy relationships. You just heard from one of the most anointed, gifted speakers in the kingdom. Listen, right now, this very moment, I want you to hear me. What you just experienced is transformative. These videos are available on the Promise Keepers app. Our PK app is, to me, vital in my personal walk with Christ, with my family, as a pastor, to my church. Listen to me carefully, download the app. You have access to video, to content that will transform your life. This information will do three things. Listen to me carefully, it will inform you, it will inspire, it will impart. Information, inspiration, and impartation. Everything Promise Keeper does speaks to the heart, the head, and the hand. It speaks to the heart, your emotional domain, your affective domain, your soul. It speaks to your head your intellect, your cognitive domain, and your hand, practical teachings that will enable you to lead your home with righteousness and justice in Jesus' name. So let's do this. To that degree, I want you to hear me. We have an opportunity to sow, to donate. Thanks for listening to right On the now, Edge Podcast with Ken Harrison. One of the most ministries right now on planet Earth. We already dealt with the issues. We're privy to the stats. You heard them throughout the programming in the beginning of the summit. We are well aware, we're cognizant of the fact that marriages and families are under critical and constant assault. But through Promise Keepers, you and I can build a firewall. We can address, we can help fix, repair. The Spirit of God through PK will redeem, regenerate, restore, renew, and revive marriages. Is that a worthy cause? Is that a cause worthy of your investment right now we're allocating our financing and our funding in so many areas this may arguably be one of the most important areas you and i could ever put our money into saving marriages in the name of jesus restoring men in order to lead healthy marriages and families in jesus name give right now the information is on the screen i want you to give generously make a donation make a donation with a commitment that as these marriages are restored and renewed as men are set free from pornography as families are set free forevermore from divorce we are about to see multiple generations by the grace of god not just survive but thrive give and give generously in the name of jesus and by the way we have this three-week challenge on the same app if you begin right now, there is a 21-day, three-week challenge that will enable you to grow with discipleship resources that are completely tangential to what we just received in this summit. Do you enjoy the lessons, the teachings? We have resources, daily applications for you, for you to engage in that will empower you. After 21 days, get ready. You will not be recognized. You will not be the same man. I guarantee you that. A 2 Corinthians 5, 17 moment indeed. You are a new creation in Jesus. The old things have passed away. Everything has been made new. Begin this 21-day challenge. Now, some of you are hearing me about being made new, being transformed through the vicarious atoning work of Jesus, and you're going, Samuel, what are you talking about? 
It begins with a personal relationship with Christ. It begins by you opening up your heart, confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and Savior. That's the moment. Every single person right now on the planet is either failing, surviving, or thriving. Are you ready to thrive, to live life abundantly according to John 10.10? 10? Let me tell you what Jesus said. Jesus said this, the enemy came to rob, kill, and destroy, but I have come to give you life and life abundantly. For God so loved the world, John 3.16 says, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have everlasting life, eternal life. Through Christ, you can have eternal life, John 3.16, abundant life, John 10.10, 10, and the verse I just referenced previously, 2 Corinthians 5.17, you can have new life. Did you get that? Are you ready for eternal life, new life, abundant life? All these three beautiful outcomes of you opening up your mouth, opening up your heart, and with authenticity, confessing the Lordship of Christ. Can I encourage you to make this prayer with me? Just make it with me right now right now ready even if you've made this before make it with me right now let's do it heavenly father i confess with my mouth and i believe in my heart that jesus christ is lord and savior of my life i likewise believe completely believe that he died on the cross for the forgiveness not of some of my sins but all of my sins that he resurrected to give me life and life abundantly therefore Right now, I receive all of Jesus in all of me. I am born again. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Your life, if you just made that prayer for the first time, your life was just transformed. It is the most important utterance, the most important words ever to come out of your mouth just came out of your mouth. It literally changed your eternity. Isn't that powerful? So welcome to the body of the redeemed. Welcome to the body of Christ. If it's the first time you have ever made that prayer, you've ever articulated, expressed that prayer from an, from an authentic heart, a transparent spirit, we want to begin to engage you in this discipleship walk through Promise Keepers. There is more information on the screen, and you can always go to our app right there and say, I just received Jesus, and you're going to be bombarded with great information that will enable you not to fail or just survive, but to thrive for the glory of Christ. I hope and pray this summit has blessed your life. I truly do believe that we are about to see holy, healed, healthy, happy, humble, hungry, honoring marriages rise up in Jesus' name, filled with God's precious Holy Spirit, and do nothing less than change the world. Thanks for listening to On the Edge Podcast with Ken Harrison. For a lot of you, this is our first time meeting, and I want to tell the men listening about an organization I'm the current chairman of, Promise Keepers. Promise Keepers is an organization founded by Coach Bill McCartney that's led men across the world to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Promise Keepers is calling men back to courageous and bold servant leadership. To learn more and get involved in the mission of Promise Keepers, visit promisekeepers.org. Follow on social media or download the Promise Keepers app on Apple Store or Google Play by searching Promise Keepers. Through the Promise Keepers app, you'll receive access to devotionals, Bible studies, and other great articles and video content, and a community to build friendships, lead your family, and become transformative leaders. See you next time for On the Edge with Ken Harrison.